Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Dan and this is Valhalla Games. So recently we shared with you a video on some offensive miniatures products. And in particular, the products that I'm going to talk about today are the British Airborne Paratrooper Sniper and the British Airborne Medic and Casualty Vignette that we starred in that video. So I'm going to use these to talk about a subject that's near and dear to my heart. How to paint British Airborne in World War II. And while we're doing that, I hope to share with you a few tidbits on some historical background on the items and equipment they're using and wearing. So with that in mind, go grab your paints, grab some models, and get ready to sit down and paint and learn with me. Hey, welcome back. So what we've got is we have our medic and the casualty from British Airborne. We've got them undercoated now. So to be honest, I actually normally use a black undercoat and the, or primer and the one which I generally use is from Citadel the Games Workshop uh, paint manufacturer or subsidiary I love their Chaos Black spray primer I'll tell you why you could darn near almost turn the can upside down on a crazy angle it's still gonna spray out it's fine it dries lovely it is fantastic stuff um, I've never heard anybody complain about that I've heard people say they'd like it to be cheaper but uh, I think the quality, you know, the price is a conversation between quality and, and, and expense, put it that way. So instead of using that black, because I'm out of it, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get through more of the, uh, the white that's been sitting around. I've, I've had it for years, actually. So I sprayed this with uh, the Citadel Skull White, the older one. So here you can see, here's the, um, first of all, here's the focus on me. There we go, so there's the casualty, you can start to see now the awesome detail it's got. See the angle he's got there as well. And the medic himself as well. Looking into his Godfrey bag there, pull out a shell dressing, or other medical stuff is required. So beautiful stuff. Right, so next question is, okay, I have to think about how are we going to base these? Yeah, you know, what's the finished product going to look like? So before I put a single base on them, what I did is I put them together like so, and then I got out a bunch of bases. Now I actually really like the um, the uh, uh, World Games bases. I like the way they're nice and thin. There we go, focus for me. By the way, nice and thin, uh, good plastic, good stuff. So I've got a 60mm base here, the one for the heavy weapons. I've got a 40mm base here, um, not seen quite as much, but sort of a small team, stuff like that as well. And I've got a pill-shaped base. Not really a fan of the pill-shaped base. However, yeah, what I can tell you is that if I put these miniatures on now, forget the, uh, the white... 25mm base that these are on at the moment they are just there for painting okay so forget about those um, it's part of the consideration but I could put that this pair of miniatures on this base this pill shaped base and it would actually fit perfectly but I have an irrational hatred for them to be honest um, I just unless it's like a prone LMG or something like that I, I just don't like them but, uh, alright, so, perfect size, but would it be any good um, for me to have that? Let's put them on to the 60mm base. Okay, so to be honest, that looks really nice on there. Um, looks nice on there mostly because of the, the 25mm base on there. If you con forget concentrating that base and look at the models on there, I think... The composition is a bit too open. I could build up some fantastic uh, scenery around that and make it a nice vignette. So I wouldn't be against that size base. However, I'm thinking what can I actually do to make it darn near perfect. So the 40mm base. If I put on the 40mm base and I'm forgetting the actual entire base on there, I'm just concerning myself with the edge of um, the medic space and if needs be I could just trim it off just a little bit so you can see now I could fit that on there 
can lean the casualties head back it's not quite going there at the moment because the way these are mounted and the casualties heels are just going to be overhanging Yep, less than it is now, just overhanging the edges 40mm base. Now I'm okay with that. Yep, and I think looking at the excess on here, okay, the excess base around, I just think that's going to make for a nicer composition than the excess uh, spare area that the 60mm base gives me. Okay, oh, you can hear someone driving away outside there. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, and it's got room to uh, put down a weapon and stuff here as well for the casualty on this side or that side or whatever too. So it's going to be just enough scenic element for it, just enough composition, you know, focus on the uh, the two models themselves. So I'm really happy with that. So that's what I want to go for. Next thing, how do I paint, how do I uh, mount them for painting? So first things first, yep, this one here, yeah, is going to block, well both models are going to block each other from being painted yeah, parts being painted if I put them both on together and then paint them so I don't want to do that I did think, well how about I just mount this one to the base yeah, that's okay it's not a bad consideration and sometimes I do I'll just drag that out of the way so I can turn it over a bit better okay, but the first thing is, is that you have to remember when you're painting underneath certain areas you want to get into them, so if I'm painting the underneath of the legs or the bag or trying to get into the helmet stuff like that putting it in the correct position on this 40 mil base you can see now if I turn this over it's going to make it really hard to paint those areas yeah you know, on the angle that I need so I'm actually better off in this case leaving it off yeah painting on this 25 mil base yeah and then uh, I've just fixed it with a tiny little drop of super glue same with the other model as well just gently breaking it off and then putting it down onto the other onto the 40mm base for final basing once I'm done. So those are my considerations, how I'm going to base and therefore how am I going to paint it. Now another model I've got, let's pull that off to the side, is I've got the uh, the sniper that you get in the um, offensive miniatures, British paratroopers, the whole set. So it comes with this scenic base, yep now, my paras are all um, based as if they are in an urban environment, um, specifically around Market Garden. Okay, so I want to take this because I want to have a little bit extra to put around here to put a little bit of elements of urban on there. I can put some bricks and stuff on here, that's no problem, but I just wanted a little bit more. So this is almost bang on fitting onto this 40mm base. You can see it's right up to the edge there, right up to the edge here. So what I did is I just shaved away some of the lip so that this is on there and again some of the lip at the back that's so on there now and all this area here and here is going to get filled in by um, uh, by grout you know, or some urban rubble or whatever the case is what I'm trying to do is I'm going to build up a bit of an area as if it was um, uh, a bomb you know, crater or something like that, uh, and uh, just with a bit of maybe urban stuff around it, maybe it's in a garden, you know, and we've got a little bit of stuff falling down off the building next to us, something like that. So yeah, so definitely some earth, but just a few bricks and boards and wood and stuff like that around the outside. Now, something again, if I mounted that on here, I wouldn't be able to get into all the nooks and crannies to paint the sniper, so I've done the same consideration here, excuse my fat fingers, and I mounted the sniper onto a 25mm base. Now, here's we start getting into our next step in the thought process. How do I start to paint the miniatures? So first things first, yep, these ones here, yep. In fact, well, all the miniatures I tend to paint inside out. So probably go, you know, normally something like skin, then uniform and so on and so forth, because then it's you're layering on top, it looks a bit more natural um, and you, you get less paint from the last step onto the uniforms etc. If I left the uniform till, if I left all of the skin till last, I'd probably get some on the uniform and that'd be frustrating to have to do it again. Yep, so this one here, yep, and the other casualty, I've got some slightly different plans for those. Yeah, the skin's not too bad, it's quite open. 
but I'm going to paint the skin after I've painted, oh, sorry, based the uniforms. So I'm going to get a layer or a layer um, of each and then some washes on basically everything on the uniform before I start painting in the skin on these two guys. I can do that because it's nice and open. It means I can wash the uniform, which I'm going to do later in a dark color, and I'm not ruining the skin. Yeah, I can be much more liberal and get it on there. Don't need to worry about it. Save some time. In contrast, this sniper, right, so for him, yeah, got loads of little bits like the fingers and stuff in there and around the neck and the face, yeah, the eye, the cheek in there. Yeah, the skin is not finished by any stretch of imagination. However, what I have done is I've built up most of the layers in there, probably a highlight or two, wait, probably two to three highlights to go. So paint that first, and then I'm going to do the uniform, the helmet, and so on and so forth. I'm going to do that now. Yeah, I just have to be more careful with my wash, but I'm doing it two different ways um, for the reasons that I spoke about. So with that in mind, I'm going to start getting into uh, putting the base coats on. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use green ochre, there we go, okay, Vallejo Monocolor, I'm going to do the smocks, yep, the Denison smocks, and I'm going to use English uniform, yeah, again, Vallejo Monocolor, yeah, I'm going to do the trousers, okay, then I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk you through what colors I'm going to use next. It's wrong. Before I come back, I'm going to base the helmets in either this color, Caliban Green, the old Citadel Dark Angels Green. Yep, so that's the helmets. And then I'm going to dry brush them with this color here, Citadel Lauren Forest. Hi guys, welcome back. So here you can see the start of the layering process. Um, colors are actually just starting to dry there, so uh, that shines a bit normal. So what I really wanted to show you here is I wanted to show you the process for painting the helmets. So as I said, we've put on our uh, dark green, and it really is a, a green green, so to speak. Um, so for me, I use this uh, Caliban Green by Citadel or Dark Angels Green, the older color. Um, that's something like the green steel helmets made out of. Yep, well, the green painted steel helmets made out of. And what we're actually doing, I've talked about it already, is we're painting the scrim, or the netting that goes on top. If I show you the top there now, there you go, you can see it. So you can see in there, in this area in here, there you go in there, where I'm pointing to. So you can see the scrim coming through there yeah not so not the large sort of camouflage sort of parts made out of sandbag and stuff like that that's just your scrim netting put on top of the helmet that those other cam parts are attached to so this is a um a lighter sort of olive color olive drab sort of color um and that's put on there to basically uh when this other sort of camouflage material is not put on top it's put on there to stop the reflection, um, or sorry, the, the glint of the steel coming through, especially if it's scratched. Um, so, you know, we sort of uh, get a less of shine. And also, because it's a bit of an irregular surface, break up a little bit of shape, not so much, but in this secondary sort of a thing. But certainly the, sh the shine for, you know, why things are seen. So that's what it looks like after put the dark green on before we do the dry brushing. So I'm going to show you now what it looks like after. There you go, it's going to come slowly into focus here. Well done. All right, and there you go. You can see that scrim has started to really come up and be picked out there now. Spin it around, there you go, you can see it in there. So at the moment we're not painting in the cloth on top, the, the hessian, anything like that. We're just painting that. Because we're dry brushing, you know, we're dry brushing out a, um, a lighter colour. So that's this colour here, the Lauren Forest that I was talking about, Citadel. Yep, 
But here's a bit of an example for you. If you don't know how to dry brush, so there we go. So I spoke already about how we're doing things differently. So you can see now that basically when I go to dry brush here, so I'm going to show you the technique in a minute, it's going to go all over the smock, which is the uh, the, the uniform top that this paratrooper is wearing, and also on his battle dress trousers. Yep, you can see even base coating it's got it all over there. So really what we're doing is we're painting this first to prevent it from um, becoming a mess all over that uniform there. And what we do to do that is, okay, I've shaken up the paint. And like all sort of our paints, it's trying to close on me here. I've let it sit. And I've let it sit there for about five minutes so that the um, mixtures in here is generally the thicker, more viscous stuff because that's going to help us dry brush. Then I've got my actual dry brush, a bit of a short, stubby, sort of bristled brush. And this one here has probably had slightly better days. I'll put a little bit on there, like so. And then I'm going to rub it nearly all off my brush. I'm going to push that paint pot out of the way now. So when I show you the next thing, you're going to really see what's going on. Just going to zoom out here. All right, I've got it nearly all off my brush there now, or I hope I have, here's the test. So I should draw it across my skin. Okay, there was a bit much left on there, and you can see those first couple of things, it's uh, brush drawers, it's left some on there. Yeah, I'm just gonna keep going now until my brush should come across and it should just gently pick up the detail of my hand, but no more. Right, so that is a brush that's, a dry brush, you know, just enough paint on there. But also, another thing about dry brushes, make sure your brush isn't actually wet from water, you know, from cleaning it first as well. So dry brush in two ways, you know, free from water, and then only a minimum of paint on there. And what we're gonna do, is we're going to lightly draw it across, or flick it across that helmet, in the area that we need it to be. Yep, it's almost like little stabby motions with it. Yep. We're picking up all the detail that's on there. So backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. I'm getting where the scrim has now been uh, folded back under the brim of the helmet. Going to get in there around all the details. Okay, and there we go. So you can see, I've actually got a tiny little bit of that coming off in there, but that's okay. That's okay, I'll just uh, put a tiny little edge highlight on of that Lauren Green. And we can see in there, you can see just around there, there you go, you can see I've picked out the Hessian, sorry, the, um, the scrim on the helmet. That's dry brushing, if I need to do it again, Yep, I just put a little bit more paint on my brush, wipe it off onto a, a piece of tissue or a piece of cardboard or something. Yep, test it again on my finger and go back in and do it again. So that's dry brushing guys, saying so, that's also how to attack it around the other stuff so um, you're not ruining the paint you've already done. Yep, sequencing, it's important. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and finish, touch up just that edge, and then I'm going to uh, paint in the battle dress and the battle of his trousers, and the Denison smock, which is the camouflage smock or jacket this guy's wearing. Yep, just the base coat, same as the other two models, and I'll see you back shortly. Thanks guys. Hi guys, as you can see, there we go, we've got those base coats down on the uh, uniform, yep, the Denison smock and the, uh, the trousers, the battle dress trousers. Now you can see that it's um, not really a solid colour in a lot of points. And that's okay, because again, normally I use black, but this time I've used the white. Um, so what we've got is we've got it quite thin in parts on high points. I can handle that. Yep, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a wash over it later. And uh, if the um, those points still need doing to make the colour more solid, then I'll go back and do them. Otherwise, I'll just use it as part of the, the highlighting process. So, there's... Um, uh, thank heaven for small mercies, you know, using the process to help you. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to carry on building up 
uh, the inside out method of painting these okay inside out means uh, I guess you could say well stuff on top of the smock first but that's not correct what we're going to do is we're actually going to go into painting the actual smock themselves yeah and in a minute I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, um, info on the Denison smock, a little bit of background. Remember this is our paint and learn, so I'm going to go into that. I'm going to talk a wee bit about the shape of the camouflage that we're going to paint on it and stuff like that. For the moment, yep, what I want to do is I just want to point out, if I put this down, the colours we're going to use and how we're going to do it. So the colours to lay down the initial uh, base coat of the camouflage. First of all, Citadel Dryad Bark. Yep. Um, it's almost like a chalky dark brown, really really nice, um, and I use that for all my uh, all my British Airborne Dennis Smock base colours, the cam, and the same for this, okay, so Panzer Series Vallejo Panzer 823 Luftwaffe Camouflage Green, same thing for that. Yeah, this is going to be a long way away from the end um, result, let's put those over there. So we'll just wait for that to come into focus. There we go. So this is an end result. So we're going to talk more in a minute when I'm taking you through the background. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply it all over in that sort of base block colours. Um, we're going to highlight it with the other colours on top. So you can see it's quite a way away from the um, the colours which are shown you there. I'm going to talk about uh, talk about that more in a second. So. Listen in now, and I'll take you through a wee bit of history on the Denison smock and how its colours and the pattern that you need to paint it in. So let's talk about the British Airborne smock, the faithful Denison smock. So there's a number of series of these, or a number of patterns. So let's start from the first one. The first one is designed that a base colour and a sandy yellow sort of a colour. Reason for that is that's a base colour designed for the theatres of operations which the Parachute Regiment and Airborne Forces being deployed in at that time. After initial trial operations, the Brunival Raid, etc., after that, they were mostly employed around the area of the Mediterranean and North Africa. So that's why that yellow sandy sort of ochre base was chosen. On top of that, they had a pea green and a dark brown stripes over top and sort of a random brush stroke pattern. Now you'll notice when you look at it that you can see areas where you've got a quite um, defined edge and then it's feathers out at the end. And this is a really important part to pick up when you're painting a Denison smock. So have a good look at the pictures, see how it feathers out in the end and then you'll see a nice consistent line as well for another edge. And that appears to be how it was painted by brush strokes, almost like a, like a mop or a brush effect to paint the pattern on. Also, the colours can be quite translucent and then darken where they covered each other as well. So there's another interesting feature about it. The smock itself had a, a half-length zip, had knitted cuffs, and it had a tail which hung down at the back. When pulled through the crotch and fastened at the front by steel snaps, okay, it could be used to hold equipment in and also stop air getting up inside on a parachute descent. It's being exceptionally handy for an airborne soldier. When not in use and not fastened up, it quite often uh, hung loosely at the back, and this gained the members of the parachute regiment the nickname Devils with Tails or the Red Devils by the Germans in Tunisia. I think the second series, that first pattern was produced. Okay, a lot of the features of these remain contested. All right, however, um, a lot of these at the time appear that uh, those that could afford them added full-length zippers in there, and also some of them removed the knitted cuffs and put on button cuffs as well. Later on in the war, there was a second pattern which was produced. They began to replace the early models in 1944. So this version featured buttoning tabs at the cuffs instead of the knitted cuffs. And it also had brass snap fasteners to sew the beaver tail inside the jacket when it wasn't needed at the back. 
Okay, the half zip on this smock was brass instead of seal, and the colours of the second pattern smock reflected the theatre of operations in which the parachute regiment and airborne forces were expected to operate in northwest Europe. So therefore, you've now got, as you can see in the pictures, a darker green colour rather than the uh, ochre sandy coloured base. You can see that the colours of the brown on top were affected by this colour and gave it a much redder hue. You can still see the effects of the colours of the brush strokes over going over top of each other. And although people debate whether the painting or application of the camouflage pattern changed in its method, it's still got the same feathered effect okay, at the end of the strokes and also the defined line on others. So it still remains a consistent thing and something that which you as a painter of the Denison Smock and British Airborne really need to try and nail. All right, lots of officers' smocks versions were produced of all different sorts and varying runs. And a lot of officers often uh, did their own modifications to them, including the woolen collar, which can be seen uh, in such pictures as can be found, or and quite often displayed by the officers in movies such as A Bridge Too Far. So check those out if you want to know how to paint those. There's some good pictures on there. So following the Second World War, so the airborne units and army reduced to one division, okay, and then later on to a brigade. But the Denison smock continued to live on and be issued to the airborne paratrooper. post war smocks still stayed, to all the same purposes, identical which is a fantastic tribute to the design of the smock for it to last so long. Okay, the knitted woolen cuffs were standard. Okay, and it can be very hard to actually pick a post-war smock in the early period from the wartime smock. Most often it can be found in the colour fastness of the camouflage itself. But all intents and purposes, painting it is much the same. Later on then, a newer type of Denison smock was produced in the late 50s. Officially it was called the Denison smock 1959 pattern, although there's evidence it might be introduced as early as 56 or 57. This smock reverted to the original to incorporate thick knitted cuffs, but this time a full length zipper. And it also had a much more consistent application of the brush stroke camouflage pattern. It appeared as if it repeated much more on the material that was then cut out to pattern and constructed the smock. You'll notice throughout all the parachute smocks, the Denison smocks, that one of the things that's another defining characteristic of painting it is how the camouflage stops the edge of the cutout patterns such as the pockets, where the zip is, the hems, etc, etc. So something that you really want to nail because it's been cut out of the fabric and then constructed rather than the garment constructed and then having the camouflage applied and as if with different armies or types of camouflage. So, early 59 Patton Dennison smock can be seen in the pictures. What can also be seen in there is the DZ or drop zone flashes which are displayed. Okay, the ones you can see are red, therefore they are the 1st Battalion, the Parachute Regiment. Blue ones are the 2nd Battalion, green is the 3rd Battalion, and the Territorial Force Battalions have their own markings as well. What's interesting about these is that although the colour of the smock is the same, that these DZ markings were displayed from that time onwards, and... It also means that if you pick up uh, World War II British Airborne figures, keeping a mindful eye on the weaponry and some of the other equipment, that the basic uniform, therefore, remains the same right up to the 1970s, with the change of the battle dress trousers into denim trousers, once the uh, British Airborne started getting, or British Paratroops started getting deployed in Operation Banner in Northern Ireland. So the beloved Denison smock was employed all the way through, and it was employed right up to the late 1970s, when the Paratroop Regiment wanted to have a revolution, as they were ordered to change to 
DPM or destructive pattern material uniforms. Luckily, the Denison smock style continued in the British airborne pattern style smock. And again, right up to this very day, through MTP pattern camouflage, the Dennis, basic Denison smock design still continues, which is a tribute to it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back and we're going to look at how we can apply the principles we've seen and what we've seen from uh, looking at the actual product and applying it to painting our model. So here we go guys, uh, now you know a bit of history of the Denison Smog. This is a finished offensive miniatures uh, model. This is one from the uh, British Paris Command set. So I'm going to go and paint my Denison Smogs now. Okay, you've seen them before when I showed them to you earlier. So points to note, this is obviously a finished one with the layers on top. But I'm not going to go over too much of the model. Now, this is a balance between realism and what looks good on the table. Okay, a couple of things I try and do. I try not to cover all the shoulders. Yep, and make sure you leave enough of the open base colour. Yep, so that base colour, the reason why is... Yep, as soon as you start painting the webbing over the top, any uh, accoutrement and equipment and stuff like that on it, yep, you can see now that the um, more and more space gets taken up. You need that empty space, yet you need it to balance out the colours. Yep, less, in a lot of cases, more. Next thing, yep, quite opposite to what camouflage is good for, you actually want the outline of your miniatures to be seen on the table. Yeah, for your photographs, it just looks fantastic. So try not to completely cover all the shoulders, or both shoulders at least, of your miniature. Leave a little bit exposed. Yeah, it will make your miniatures pop on the table. It'll look very, very good. So, same thing again at certain points like this. Turn that around. Yeah, there's our shoulder from the front. Yeah, to balance that one there that you can't see. Yeah, so I highly recommend it. Next thing is, you want to make sure that in areas of pockets and stuff like that, yep, you have a few of the areas that are painted a colour align with areas that aren't. Yep, and same, if we go onto the back here, that join there, the epaulette join there to the, the shoulder of the, of the sleeve, all these things epaulette there again against that camouflage. These things make it look real guys. There you go, the camouflage on the edge of the collar against the main body. It makes the joins stand out. Yeah, invest your time into doing it. You can see there the, I suppose you call it the gusset of the sleeve I guess underneath there, underneath the armpit. Yeah, the break there of the camouflage of the sleeve versus the the shirt, well, in this case it's actually a um, piece of the webbing, but there you go. And my phone goes, I'm showing you, but um, never mind. And you see the uh, the cuffs there as well on this particular model of this um, Denison smog. So guys, those are all top tips for you. Yeah, they'll make it look much more realistic. It will pop, but in a realistic way on the table. Yeah, people won't even recognize why they like it so much, but it is attracted to the eye. So I'm going to go away and I'm going to paint these uh, other miniatures here. Yeah, remember, I'm just base coating. They're not going to end up like this quite yet. Yeah, but I'm going to lay those basic colors down, and uh, I'm going to come back to you soon, and we'll see you for the, uh, for the end of that step. See you soon. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. What I do with my guys, uh, my British Airborne, is at the moment I'm predominantly painting them. Um... Mostly in like the first pattern, uh, first pattern Denison smock colours. Um, when I come to the camouflage on top, it is uh, a little bit of a juxtaposition, but I'll, I'll talk about that later so I can sort of uh, go across the time periods. But let's talk about the uh, the base colour first. So remember the first uh, pattern Denison smocks are produced in like a sandy sort of a colour. Yep, and color I've got for that is this green ochre color by uh, Vallejo model color okay 70.914 so that's going to give me a nice yellowish base 
Come into focus there. Move that out of the way. That's going to give me a nice base like this one here. And turn it around. The same one you've seen already. Yep. Now, later on in the war, uh, early 44, the second Patton Denison smock came into use. And that was uh, coloured more and more towards the... Um, the uh, European theatre of operations rather than the Mediterranean. So for this one here, go for like a moss colour. So the base, uh, go for this foundry and it's a moss triad. Yep. So you go, so it's 29, uh, 29 A, B, and C. So the base, 29 A, and the, um, uh, the predominant colour is 29 B. And there you can see. The difference between the two colors yep now that will provide you with a different color to that and I use these guys here in uh, my Falschmega smocks so just to put down one of those there you can see on there the slightly green um, tinge to that to that smock yep for the Falschmega and that's the sort of greenish tinge you get off the uh, the British smocks from the 44 pattern onwards. Yep, so basically what I'm going to use though, again, as I say, for uh, the majority of the I'm doing at the moment, I use it across a couple of different time periods, and so to do so, I, um, uh, to produce a camouflage that goes across both, I actually stick with like an earlier pattern. Um, again, men could have held on to their smocks, um, you know, from earlier, but they won't have the greener pattern earlier on if we go to the Mediterranean. So I go this green ochre. What I do then is I have placed a base coat down, and from there I've got two choices. So eventually, the whole miniature, more or less, is going to be washed with uh, with black. Okay, and that black is um, null oil, null oil wash by Citadel. Now it could be any sort of black wash that's available out there. Yeah, I like non oil, I know its properties. Yep, so what I've done here is I have uh, I've washed that and then I have um, just gone over top of it again and you notice that I have made sure that I've left in you know the, uh, the, the shadows of course the seams as well they're important Yep, so little seams around the hem of the cloth there, down there. When I put the camouflage on these, some of these are going to be covered, but I found it's actually really useful to do it now, um, rather than trying to go back. Because when I'm layering up this um, this ochre colour, the base colour to this denison, basically if I've got the camouflage pat stripes on there, I can't then run with the fabric with my brush I have to continually stop it wherever the the camouflage crosses my path so it's quite handy to do it now and then um, and then put the camouflage on the option to that is and excuse the uh, the little bit of the the dark flesh base tone around the collar I'm not worried about that because um, I'm going to get to put the camouflage on the denison and uh, uh, if it decides not to cover that part, I'll just go back over it again with the, the green ochre. But moving on, there's a second alternative method, and that's this one here. Yeah, just waiting for it to zoom in. So this one here is more of a basic method, where I'm just putting the green ochre down, and then I'm building up the um, the Denison cam all over it. Yep, in a way which I've talked about already. Yep, not too much on. Remember that plenty of it's going to be covered by webbing and stuff. That is going to look busier than what it seems at the moment. Go a little bit less of the um, the pattern. Yep, leave spots of the base color. Yep, they will get filled in, and more and more of this smock will get filled in by things like the webbing colors and stuff like that. Okay, it's not going to look wide open like that. You need to leave some space, let the color breathe, so that you can. Um, pick out those colors later on. Yep, so that's this one. And then this on this version, what I'll do is I'm going to 
uh, block in all the colors of the webbing yep the water bottle the webbing itself everything like that and then I'm going to wash the whole thing with that null oil wash everything together yeah, it means I have a little bit more difficulty in highlighting up that base colour of the Denison smock, but uh, I tend to actually do it this way more than uh, with the other way. The other way, I tend to do it more with character models. Yeah, and I feel like since it's a vignette um, for both of these, I would probably do it for both in the other style where I um, I wash and then re-highlight the Denison smock prior. But I really want to show you both um, both methods here. So whichever one works for you. What I'm going to do now on the other ones is going to now um, layer it up with the Denison um, cam pattern. Okay, much like this. Okay, and you get it to that stage. Then all the models, I'm going to then put the webbing. Yep, so I'm going to uh, block the colours of the webbing in, the boots, the putties, um, the uh, hessian and so on, and the, and the helmet. All that sort of stuff. So join me back soon, I'm going to show you what that stage looks like. Thanks guys, see you then. Hey guys, welcome back. So we're at the end of that stage. What we've done is we have uh, taken the uh, khaki colour, this one here, and we've gone over all the um, the pouches, so on and so forth. So there's a little bit of information around the um, colour for Blancos and stuff like that, which we're going to talk about shortly. Um, so I can tell you more about that. However, I've gone for that colour. Um, for the reasons which I've said in the bit of the background. So what we've done is I've blocked in the um, burnt umber. So that is just the uh, this one here. Okay, Vallejo burnt umber into the uh, the water bottle there. Khaki up the straps. Okay, on the entrenching tool cover. Um, not worried about that yet. I've gone all over that. I've gone on the uh, the straps around the in the webbing attachment loops um, around the water bottle as well. The cork in the top. Um, also on the straps of the uh, the medic, the med pack or the Godfrey pack, as it were. Yep. So you can see that's all blocked in too on the straps down the front. I've also taken that same khaki and uh, done some of the the the. Um, uh, the Hessian on the camouflage scrim on the helmet. There we go. Uh, the other colour that's there as well is this one here. It's a German cam medium brown, fellow model colour, it's a Panzer series. Um, that is the colour of the brown on top there. Okay, so other things we've got to do, or other things we've done. So the boots went from being black, okay, and I put a highlight on them. So you can see it there. It is a bit of a um, turquoise sort of a colour actually on the highlights around the toe, the heel of the boot. I've actually gone on the leather sole itself as well too um, in certain places like here I'm facing upwards. Um, I'm not going to really um, delineate the, the leather sole bottom too much in that. Just pick it out like that there. Um, no the hobnails. Um, so I have got one thing yet to do yet on here. I've done the same on all the other models too. So I'm not going to have a look at those um, in detail. I'll show you them briefly. One thing I'm going to do on here is I'm going to do the Medics okay, armband on here. So that's a white armband. Ends up with a red cross in it, of course. And for that, I've gone for an old colour. Okay, oh, playing 10 pin bowling there. Okay, I've gone for this one, Deb Stone. But anything that's like that, um, quite a uh, stone sort of a colour rather than just straight um, uh, khaki or straight white. So put that on there, move that out of the way because that's not focusing correctly. There you go, let it do its business. Put that on there too. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to wash everything. I'm going to wash everything with that same non oil wash guys. Yep, I'm going to do the webbing. I'm going to do the helmet, and the helmet I'm going to stay away from that netting in most places, the actual scrim. I'm going to concentrate on the hessian, building out the layers on that. I'm going to do the straps, all the canvas straps. I'm going to do the Godfrey bag. I'm going to do the uh, trousers, because they haven't been washed yet. I'm going to do the putties, the boots as well, um, all the straps and entrenching tool and stuff like that on the back. Just before I wash it, actually, one thing I need to do, I'm just going to paint um, the entrenching tool, the shovel handle. I'm going to paint that a dark sort of scorched brown colour or charred brown 
and then I'll have a um, like a gun metal sort of color on the end on the metal attachment end going to do that and then I'm going to wash all those parts with null and all and I'm going to let it dry once I've done that I'm going to show you how far I've got and uh, I'm going to really concentrate then on on layering things up I'm going to go um, over the um, trousers again on all the high points and midtones. going to go with English uniform again um, Rolo model color um, start building up the colors in there I'm going to go over the canvas again in the same uh, khaki color which I showed you a minute ago um, and I'm going to go over the helmet hessian colors the same color again to start highlighting them up same with the medic's armband with that uh, that need stone or that stone color whatever you're using stone gray would probably be a great option for um, the Vallejo range so I'm going to do all that and uh, then I'll come back and I'll show you the next time you see this and the other models which I'll go through now you'll see them with basically some more layers and some more shades added to it let's wait for this bad boy to start to focus and see again same situation We're at the same point with that one and lucky last is the sniper now what I could do on the sniper is I could probably um, black out all the um, uh, the metal parts on the rifle, leaving the wood, the wooden furniture um, brown, and then wash those parts. So there we go, same stage for him as well. So when you see him next, I'll have all that done. I'll have the layering done up, one more uh, layer for everywhere. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you then about what colours I painted the Denison camouflage. I'll have it finished, then I can show you um, the colours that I painted. Thanks guys, see you shortly. Bye. Hey, welcome back. Here we go. Our sniper is pretty close to being finished now. So if I just bring him up here, I'll check him out. Here we go. So we can see there now the uh, Denison patches done in the uh, the lighter colour, highlighted up. Okay. I'll show you those right now. The colours that I used there. It's a brown as with this colour here, so Vallejo model here, C1.035, that's camouflage light brown. And the green, I had to write this in with a pen, find it out, uh, C1.006, I believe this is camouflage light green as well, um, Vallejo model here. But that's the number, I think this is one of the colours that Vallejo changed the name of. So um, yeah, just go off the, uh, off the number there guys, C1.006. So you can see what we've done there, the patches have gone over and we've tried to leave a little bit of the um, the darker colour showing through on the edge. Okay, it's a little bit reverse to what the how it would be in reality, but to the um, human eye it looks very pleasant and that's why I've done it this way. Uh, next thing, the rifle. Okay, because we've only got small patches of the uh, woodwork showing through there, I've taken it as one of the type of, um, or one of the rifles that didn't have particularly great, great um, graining, um, you know, of which there's thousands of them out there in the uh, in the mass production. So I've just highlighted across the um, the tops of the furniture, okay, and the joins, okay, um, instead of doing the sort of diagonal and haphazard sort of um, graining of the wood. I've done that because I only got a little bit showing and I wanted to really um, delineate the uh, the shape of the rifle there. So for those, what I've used is that down there. Okay, Vallejo Panzerace's new wood. That's the colour there. And uh, in between, okay, this is a nice mid colour. This Mordfan brown. This is the mid colour, and that Panzerace's one is the highlight. And the um, everything that's basically uh, that's um, it's the the putties, the um, the gaiters, the um, the uh, the webbing, everything like that, anything that's been blancoed, uh, even the hessian on the barrel of the of the sniper rifle, I painted it last final highlight um, after rehighlighting it with the uh, khaki. I've given it this um, Vallejo Panzer Aces of light mud. I think it's uh, three one five. So that's a fantastic colour too, and um, looks really good. So, last thing, 
the boots. Okay, the boots. So I use a really nice turquoise looking highlight and for that I use uh, this is Privateer Press P3. It's this coal black. Get it in there so you can see without... Is it going to focus? Is the light going to fail on me? There you go. And I've highlighted that with a very thin edge highlight of the Citadel Eschen Grey. And that's my formula for those. Alright, so I've got the skin pretty much where I want it on this guy. I'm going to go away, I'm going to finish those details on the other two models, and then I'm going to come back to you, I'm going to show you what they all look like, I'm going to show you uh, the start to the basing of the actual three models. See you soon. Thanks guys. Alright, so welcome back. So we're quite a way on with this one now. You can see I have um, gloss varnished the sleeve. I've got some uh, transfers from a um, manufacturer there, or decals, and I have applied the um, parachute wings onto the right arm of the smock, correct place, then gloss varnished over top of that again. Um, quite well on on the um, shading, highlighting, and so on. But I want to talk now about color choices, color selection, and uh, it's nice, um, we don't often see blonde hair as much as, um, as we see dark coloured hair in models. It's nice to give blonde hair every now and then. But um, I wanted to talk about giving it to this model here because what I've done is I've, I've done that. I'm sort of quite happy. You know, it's because it's sort of a World War II sort of style, um, sort of swept back. Uh, he's obviously been groomed before he went on this operation or whatever the case is. So I'm fairly happy with actually the execution of it. However, I'm, uh, I'm not quite so happy with the colours now because when I put it all together like this and zoom in, move it out here actually, to me it looks like there's just too much of that sort of khaki colour um, going into the hair. Obviously, they don't quite line up correctly because they're on the bases. It's just a bit of little bit too much of that, that colour there I think. So I'm going to review it, so likely I'm going to go back to um, a brown, a dark coloured here so it provides some contrast. Um, we've got the pouches, the webbing, um, we've got the, the uh, um, Red Cross armband there that's going to get a little bit more of a white highlight onto it there going into a um, into a bit of a buff colour but yeah there's a lot of that colour going on in there and I think dark colour here might provide a bit more um, contrast so watch your space I'll check it out and I'll see as I progress but um, we're quite way on with these um, and likewise with the sniper model himself we're getting pretty close as well I'll hold this up in here there we go so he's quite a way on there now. So again, um, same thing again there. So I'm going to finish these off now. Join me back soon, and uh, you're going to see the finished article, I hope. See you soon. Bye. Hi guys, welcome back. So we're pretty close to finishing the model. Now, one thing that the uh, two sets of models that I've just painted up for you don't have, but it's an important part of Airborne Forces, British Airborne Forces, is the Maroon Beret. Yep. Now, I know that uh, you know, there's a lot of folklore and history, um, movies even, um, called the Red Beret. Yep, but the beret is um, a maroon colour. Okay, so it's much darker than that red. So here's a really good color depiction of it here okay silver cap badge yep darkened black and cap badges on the parachute regiment soldiers weren't um, adopted until uh, later and sort of um, operations like uh, Operation Banner and Ulster and so on and so forth um, so very much silver for the actual parachute regiment soldiers at this stage now obviously other members 
of the British Airborne Forces had uh, cloth cap badges um, for general staff and a few other um, units. Uh, as well as that, you know, there are other people attached to the Airborne Forces, but the parish regiment itself, silver cap badge. So do a bit of history, uh, do a bit of search in there, find the one that's applicable to you. So, what colour? Here we go. Well, for a start, I can tell you the reason why it needs to be a maroon colour. Well, here's mine. Yep, now that's not going to show up too well in this light here, but suffice to say, here we go, it's starting to change. It is very much a darker colour than a lot of the reds that people paint them. Best colour to use, okay, and the scale is this one here. Alright, so that's Corn Red by Games Workshop. Honestly, if you only used one colour, I would use Corn Red, wash it black, and then re-highlight it in Corn Red. That would solve all your problems. That's a really good, effective, basic paint job. You got nothing wrong with that. To get a bit more detail in there, okay, and if I put that off to a side, I'll just hold up um, our model here again, wait for it coming in focus. So you can see, apart from the black wash, just in this area here, in the uh, shaded shadow areas, okay, we've got a darker colour. Same as on the top there. There, we have got a darker colour. So for that colour there, I use this one here. Okay, it's Privateer Press Formula P3 Sanguine Base. It is very dark. Yep, so once you've applied this, um, do a transition colour, about 50-50 of this in corn red. And then go into your corn red again. Um, and if you want to highlight, this one here, Wasdaka Red. Those of you that are used to using Citadel colours will note, um, if you have it, that it doesn't really fit into the uh, regular um, tiered uh, colour spectrum, if you like, the steps or gradings of the red colours that they have. Um, this one here is very much on the maroon sort of spectrum. So that is fantastic for doing just the edge of the beret and a little bit on ridges. As so you can see just above the cap badge there. We've gone just above the ridge. Down and around. Yep, it's a fantastic colour for that. So please, team, yep, it's called the Maroon Machine in uh, Parachute Regiment uh, uh, folklore. Yep, I know there's uh, there's movies out there and so on called the Red Beret, but it is maroon. Yep, and it's pretty much been adopted as uh, by air war forces around the world as a um, uh, as a maroon beret. So let's find the correct colours to paint it. Like I said, no need to um, break the bank. Consider our corn red with one highlight. Reach across here. This one here. Um, give it a wash with black. Okay, a black wash, and then re-highlight it. Yep. If you don't use any other colours, that's the only one you need. Hey everybody, welcome back. So I mentioned during the video that I have made and based my unit during operations in Market Garden, in particular units in actually Arnhem itself. That's due to the um, colour of the cobblestones, so on and so forth. Could be in a lot of different towns, however, because it's a similar colour for a lot of towns, but um, that's the idea I'm going for. So we've seen during the video, I've shown you um, the miniatures in my army. So here's the uh, finished basing effect with those brown cobblestones and some rubble around it. So I'm going to show you now how I'm going to base up um, the medic and the casualty there. So first of all remember at the start I went into the reasons why I'd chosen a 40mm base. So here we've got our 40mm uh, base. Okay. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to, first thing is I'm going to put the cobblestones down on the base. Now you could use green stuff, um, rollers, anything like that. I've acquired uh, through Rex, thank you Rex, this um, fantastic sheet of um, bricks slash cobblestones um, that actually suits the um, effect that was in Arnhem at the time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, uh, the base and I'm going to lay it down on top of the cobblestones, I'm going to lay it face down because it's slightly smaller than the inside. I'm going to go around tightly and mark it out with a pencil and then I'm going to cut it out. Now, what I'm going to end up with then is a nice little insert that I can put into my base. And although I don't have one um, <coughs> actually prepared at the moment, you can see that I've got one here um, for the 25mm base. So this is basically how it goes on. It's just be looking at a different size base. From there, what I do is I put the miniatures on 
I can uh, do two things. I can either place the miniatures on, glue them on, and build up the base around them. Uh, remembering, of course, that when I start getting into things like dry brushing, that are really important for this, there's a good chance we're going to get on the base of the on the base of the miniature, like on its shoes, boots, whatever the case may be. Um, that's okay if that's what I want, and a certain amount of it on the the boots is what I want. However, um, I want them to have excess access to all the uh, the cobblestone stuff itself and some details on the base for the large one for the medic because I've got some details on there. So what I've done is I've uh, put the miniatures on, I've um, worked out on top of the cobblestone effect, I've worked out where the miniature is going to be and then I've put some effects around it, um, some rubble and some uh, weapons and so on. So if I move those out of the way and now I'm going to show you that base so far. So you can see I've got uh, like a window frame, I've got some rubble, some bricks there. It's just made out of um, little dust and dirt and stuff out of the garden. Um, some pebbles, some stones, uh, some square things, some bricks. Um, I've got a discarded weapon there, uh, dropped by the casualty. Um, yeah, and it's all on top of the bricks, so it looks pretty realistic. Okay, so what I have got to help me with this is I keep all my offcuts of... Um, MDF buildings. Yep, so all the little knobs that come out of the buildings, you can see them in there, they look like um, bricks and a little bit of cutting um, to make them the correct size and they look good. Uh, things like this bit here, the thin bit there, it's a nice bit of wood, maybe a rafter or a noggin or something like that coming out of the wall. Um, when it's all in rubble, it's uh, built into the, the stones, the pebbles you put on there, it looks really, really good. Um, and if I show you a finished one now, here's a bit of a sneak peek at the sniper. In this case here, I've gone for cobblestones on one side, gone for like a shell crater there. Okay, um, that he's actually um, lying on, taking cover in some wood from the buildings, woods and brick from the buildings. And this side here was um, a garden or something like that, so it's got uh, a bit of grass around it, tufts, due to the fact that um, the operation. You know, it's only nine days long in duration in, in the actual Arnhem area. Um, I made sure that most of the, the miniatures don't have any tufts on their base in, in form of regrowth um, due to the fact that that would be really unusual over that period of time. But this part here will count it as a bit of a garden and it's um, looking quite nice. I'll show you some pictures of this guy at the end. There we go. So that's the principle. Um, that's how it ends up. And uh, this is the in progress, as I say. So what I'm going to do now is, before I place the miniatures on, I'm going to get in there and I'm going to paint up everything in a base coat. I'm going to wash it. Um, and then I'm going to start thinking about putting the base on. And uh, I'm going to dry brush it first, sorry. Then I'm going to put the miniatures on, because it's a dry brushing that uh, can be the messiest. And then I'll build up a little bit of um, uh, rubble and dirt around the round base that that miniature is on there okay just to hide it away and blend it into the base and if I put that on there now okay you can start to see how it all fits together yep how I've made room to leave it on the base I've just cut away the back and the side of um, the little round plinth base that the medic is actually cast on as we discussed at the start of the video, and now he fits on there, and there's no need for the casualties um, heels to be over the edge, and also the casualties head fits into the um, resting back on the medic's uh, knee or thigh really well, so it looks really realistic. I think you'll agree that's going to fill the base nicely, so I'm going to go away and work on that now. Let's bring it up a little bit close for you. going to go away and work on that, and uh, I'll come back and I'll show you the finished article. Thanks guys, see you soon.